All right, concept clearance. My brother will be on in a second. Um, so I, I don't know if Rudy mentioned this when I was preparing this. Uh, I think it was Jeff that pointed out is that you're actually all deputized, and this is going to be a concept clearance that is not just for NHGRI, but it's for 12 other institutes. Um, and so I wrote this thinking that we're speaking for 12 institutes here. Uh, as you'll see in a second, one of the main reasons for that is because they're providing almost all of the funding. Um, and so the, I also have done several contract concept clearances before, and they're very focused really at the conceptual level. So I tried to capture the three concepts that we're essentially looking at here. Uh, I would have maybe added apple pie and mom at the bottom, but you can see this is the concepts that we're talking about. And this is a renewal of an existing program, but this is what the contract, uh, the concepts that underlie the contract. So um, should we have a large central facility uh, that can do things uh, very efficiently and for many different projects? Should the facility be structured in a way that it can be retain ultimate flexibility and change uh, as the technology changes? And is it also a good to, idea to have flexibility that if we don't need it, we don't put the money into it? And so those are the key elements of how this, concept, this uh, contract is set up. Uh, I just want to highlight that uh, it came up earlier today that I'm a big fan of intra-institute programs. I think it's because of all these advantages, shared expertise, governance, resources. You can pull research projects and you really get economies of scale. Uh, it's not something that the NIH does a lot of. It's doing more of it now than when I first got here. Uh, so we're not 27 little islands as we used to be. This is an example of an um, island that has 13 different members uh, pooling together. Uh, another way to think of it is that we're kind of running a co-op. Uh, and for those of you that are more Midwest oriented, you recognize uh, what a grain co-op does. Uh, it allows people to pull their truck up there full of the raw material and to dump it in. But, and the grain co-op actually manufactures it into refined flour with uh, defined characteristics, defined QC, and ready to go into products that we all eat. And in some ways, this is what this program does. It, it fills that middle ground instead of having investigators learn how to do phenotyping, learn how to get samples, learn how to do genotyping or sequencing, data analysis, and then figure out what the answer is. We're filling that middle layer uh, for them. Just move into some of the historical data on the center or the program. So it was founded in 1996. Bob uh, had a major hand, in, along with Francis, in setting this up. It morphed a few times in the early years, but the model that I'm going to be talking about now is the one that's been operating probably since the late 96. It's currently supported by 13 different institutes. As I mentioned in the written material, we lost one institute, we gained one institute relatively recently. Um, and it's based in, the current um, program is based in a building uh, in Baltimore, an NIH building that's been leased uh, on the Bayview campus. Uh, this is what the program currently offers, and I'm talking about this historically because what we're voting on today is what will be going on in the future, and that's a little bit more fuzzy. Um, currently, they offer SNP genotyping, including custom genotyping. There's a bunch of focused content panels. I didn't put them all on this list that are available. Uh, a lot of genome-wide association studies, as you in a second, have passed through this program. And also next-gen sequencing. Right now, the services offered are targeted exome, whole genome, both uh, deep whole genome and low-pass whole genome. Uh, and we also have a part of the program that offers statistical analysis. Mostly data cleaning, data preparation for depositing into public databases. Not that much final analysis as to here's what your data told you. That's usually what the investigators do with the data once they get it. Uh, this program has a lot of oversight. Um, there is a board of governors. Uh, representatives from each of the institutes has a member on the board. Three of them are institute directors now, I think. Uh, so the the institute director themselves are part of their, the Board of Governors. There is a CITER Access Committee, which is a peer review uh, panel that looks over projects before they come into CITER. That meets six times a year. Uh, I meet with the, the laboratory staff every other week and lots of phone calls at odd hours when things happen, uh, as well as a contracting officer's representative. This is my better half who does all of the paperwork because this is a contract. There's a lot of paperwork. Uh, so the two of us actually oversee that area. 
the NIH budget office plays a, a role in, in moving the money around, and we actually are administratively overseen by the contracting office that's run by NHLBI, and they make sure that we do everything legal, or at least right at the edge of that. Uh, shouldn't say that in public side. Here are some trends over just the last uh, couple of years. The number of projects that have passed through this center, and, and Bob, I don't remember what year you left. Was it 2006? So this is the post-Bob era. I guess this is my era. Um, the number of projects has gone up. The cost per genotype has gone way down, uh, as m most of you know. Put this in parentheses because I really think that the cost per genotype should be going down more than it is, uh, and that's because there's not enough competition in the GWAS setting. We really should have a $70 GWAS chip that's universally available instead of um, a couple hundred dollar GWAS chip. Uh, we potentially, in the next incarnation, the R Institute can play a little bit of a role in maybe pushing that. Size of the projects have gone up and up, as I'll show you in a second. Full-time staff has actually gone down, so this program's able to do more with less, fewer people. The administrative costs for a brief while were going up until we screamed and kicked and said, you can't do it this way, and then they went down. And sorry, that's the NIH administrative costs, not the cost of, from the contractor. Uh, just to give you an idea of uh, some metrics for the program, this is the samples completed per fiscal year going back to 1998. Uh, and for those of you who can't see, the top of this scale is 180,000. Uh, relevant here is in the last two years, um, completed samples mean the data is done and been released to the investigator. Uh, there's been a couple hundred thousand samples go out the door. Uh, sites, uh, we, I pulled last night, I pulled a list of where all the projects have come from, different investigators, and Amy, I know people from Texas are sensitive about this. Texas has one. For some reason, it, the program didn't put the dot on Texas. So I just did, I, <laughs> I, I didn't do all the international sites except Toronto because it happened to be on this map. But um, there are international sites as well. Many of these projects are consortium projects or multi-center projects. So we have um, projects where the samples involve three or four primary investigators but came from 25 different sites, all to Baltimore. The biggest one came from 100 sites, and that one actually really scared me, and it's been going really smoothly so far. Um, number of projects that have been posted in dbGaP. So I just show you, this is by institute at the bottom. You can see the big institutes have more. Um, NEI did, was an early adopter of GWAS studies. They have a fair bit. Uh, highlight this, and it's in the written material, just to point out that about a third of all GWAS studies in dbGaP came through this program. Uh, and probably more than a third of all the sequencing studies in dbGaP at this point probably came through here, but that's because that hasn't really hit critical mass yet, and they'll be coming in from elsewhere. This is to highlight that what the program does is it creates an automatic pipeline for data sharing, and it takes the burden, for the most part, except for some institutional certifications, off the investigator lots of times. They can actually, as part of their project, say, please share my data, the program interacts directly with NCBI, um, and we have a data cleaning center that cleans the data so it immediately is, immediately is in there and it lets the investigator focus on analyzing their data and not doing all the sharing paperwork. Just to give you a snapshot, just over the summer, um, there are active projects in the lab, there's about 100,000 samples sitting in the lab right now. Over the summer, about 30,000 of those were in data production. That means at any given time, the people could have been touching up to 30,000 samples. That probably represents about seven or eight different projects. So as you might guess, this is a program that relies on <laughs> automation, computer tracking, limb systems, and all the sophisticated ways to make sure that everything is working well. Uh, going forward, I think you might uh, guess correctly that we expect array-based Analyses will go down. They have not gone down nearly as fast as I had thought, and we're still cranking out lots of arrays, both custom arrays and GWAS study arrays. And of course, the expectation is that sequence-based projects, as the sequencing prices come down to where it's feasible to do epidemiologic size studies, that the number of samples per year that go through this program that are sequenced will go up uh, quite a bit. It's just started. We're probably just at this part of the ramp right now. Um, 
I want to end with some parameters of the program as we see it going forward. You'll see they're frustratingly broad and vague, and that's because this is not a lump sum payment. This is, you're voting on a concept to set up a program that has capacity, and uh, the more capacity is used, the more funding will go into the program. If it's not used, uh, it won't go into the program. So it will be a research development contract. It's what we call in the business an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity type structure, which means the contract it doesn't say we're going to buy X amount for the next five years. What we're buying is capacity. The term is not yet decided, but the last couple have been five to seven years. Uh, the funds, if no one uses it, could be as low as 10 million over five to eight years or even less. Or if lots of people use it, we figure the capacity could handle about 150 million over that particular interval. If you're wondering what it costs NHGRI, it's essentially nothing. Uh, in the checkbook writing stage, there's some personnel time, mine and John Garvey. Uh, but really, it, we manage this and we catalyze it for the rest of the institutes that want to join in. We're anticipating that it's an open competition. We'll have contact solicitation. We'll set up a review. And then it makes sense for something that's going to be highly efficient and centralized that there's going to be one award. I didn't mention in all this how the, since I know some of you are familiar, so I know some of you have, had, have projects that have passed through um, from CIDR. Uh, the investigator who has the project has their project reviewed, and then very much like Phil mentioned earlier, they're given a credit. They're not given cash. They're given access, and then the institute pays directly into the contract. So if you're at an institution and you want to use CIDR and you get approval to do so, it doesn't cost the investigator anything directly. Uh, and so that's how this mechanism works. So it was interesting to hear Phil talk about that same model for, for data analysis. That's all. I know that we've, it's been a long day, and I've, my brother has to get in and talk. Um, so that's all I have. I'm happy to open it up for as much discussion as we need or additional comments. Could you comment on um, comparing what's done here with uh, putting this out to the companies that are offering this uh, stuff? I mean, how, how comparable is our thing? Um, Obviously, that's changed a lot in the last five years. Yeah, I, I can tell you because we have to justify that according to competition for every single task order. And so I, I can tell you on just pricing, we're about comparable. Where we blow the commercial things away is in quality. And in charging, and that we don't charge, this program, I say we, you can say I'm in, embedded in this, the program does not charge for samples that don't produce data. Uh, so if you really, if you don't, if you send us 100 samples and you get 98 that have data, you only pay for 98. And so we have economies of scale that way. Uh, there's all these other ancillary services like the data cleaning and the data QC. Um, I, didn't mention, there's a lot of details I didn't mention. You know, sample comes in the door, it's DNA fingerprinted. So when it goes out the back end, we know it's the right sample. Those kind of layers of quality control you don't get with the commercial companies. Um, so we really do push, uh, and I really push the, the quality and the economy at the same time. I, I, we are not competitive, and I'll just to end whole genome sequencing at this point because the sequencing capacity is smallish at this stage. So. So your mom and apple pie slide, you know, I think it's it's still valid today. So I, I, I really think there is a need for such a resource, particularly for the what you call smaller institutes. That I think it's, that's a good thing. But my question is more technical. In 2015-16, is it really worth spending several hundred dollars for a GWAS chip and not getting an exon on these sample sets? And, and when is that pendulum going to shift that You'd, you're probably you being science is better off spending a little bit more and getting rare the rare variant spectrum in those specialized sample sets as opposed to another GWAS array chip that is really SNP discovery on somebody else's samples. Right, and we so so I'll give you the the short answer is that we do both, and, and there are projects that combine both. The longer answer is has to do with what you just heard for a lot of these other concepts, which are advancing technology, advancing the state of the science. This program is a little bit behind what we would call the bleeding edge. And so those are informative, and what's going on in the field is informative for what we'll offer in the future. The, the real kicker point would be if, if, if arrays stay where they are, then they'll just go away. 
and we'll just do more and more sequencing. If we can drive arrays down to be really, really cheap as a first pass, there may be ways to combine arrays and sequencing in an economically feasible way. It's, I don't think we're there yet because sequencing is still more, too expensive and arrays are still not where they should be. But I'm surprised on your sort of menu of things to do, driving sequencing costs down further doesn't seem to be coming up. It just seems like the Institute could do a lot more to help pressure us, the community, and the vendors to drive sequencing costs down further. We, we have the ability to do that via volume for established things. Where we don't have the ability to do it is to push within this program. The rest of the Institute has the ability to push it in the technology. You're, you're just talking competitive. Yeah. No further discussion? Can I have a motion to approve the concept? <clears throat> Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Larry.